Well, here at Hillcrest, we have a mission. We want to be a place where people can find and follow Jesus together. People need to find Jesus. And having found him, people need to learn how to better follow him. And we believe that all of this is best done together. And so we want to be a place where we can find, where people can find and follow Jesus together. The challenge is that the longer a group of people are together as a church, they more and more become comfortable simply being a place for people who want to learn how to better follow Jesus. And they're not focused as much on people who need to find Jesus. This is not a new problem. 2,000 years ago, in the first churches that were formed, we see the apostles already having to tell people, now don't forget, you're not just here for people who want to follow Jesus. You also need to be here for people who want to find Jesus as well. And we find some instructions from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Colossians regarding this very subject. We've been in a months-long study through this short four-chapter book called Paul's Letter to the Colossians. We end it today, and next week we wrap it all up. And uh, we have called this series Next Level Living. Because everything you find in these four short chapters have to do with getting to the next level. The next level in your understanding of Jesus, the next level in your obedience to Jesus. And in Colossians chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, he shows us how to get to the next level in our relationship with non-believers. Let's see what he says. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, uh, there's big business these days in uh, software that helps you reformulate an email so it's clearer, or reformulate a business presentation so it's easier to understand. Uh, this has uh, really been perfected uh, more and more in recent years, but it started early on with a company uh, called Reference Software International, and they had a uh, uh, they had a, a software program called Grammatic, and it was a program that would analyze written communication and suggest ways to make it easier and simpler to understand. For example, if you typed in the phrase, I have a contraindication for complying with these aspirations, <laughs> Grammatic would uh, suggest that you say, there's a reason I cannot meet these goals. <laughs> or type in, be advised to kindly replicate your recent communication, and the software recommends you just simply say, would you send that memo again? And every instance, what the, what the effort was, was to take communication and make it clearer and make it easier to understand. The Apostle Paul said that you and I need that kind of software, so to speak, when it comes to communicating, being in relationship with outsiders. Uh, in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Paul says, here's what you need to do. You need to be wise in your relationships, your communication with outsiders. And then the rest of the section is simply about what it means to be wise with people who are outsiders. Now, when Paul wrote these verses, he assumed that our commitment to Christ was going to make us odd in the world. It was going to put us occasionally in places where we felt very much out of step, out of sorts with the people around us. And if you haven't experienced that yet, you eventually will. Our beliefs about what is right and wrong make us different from the people around us. Our belief that there is a God who has an opinion about our behavior, and he will eventually judge our behavior. That makes us different than so many people around us. Our belief that Jesus died on a cross to bear away sins, that he rose bodily from the grave, that he's going to come back visibly to this earth, that makes us different than so many of the people around us. And because of that oddness, we are tempted to go in one of two wrong directions. On the one hand, we are tempted to live comfortably in society, to sort of get along, go along, blend in, and not stand out. On the other hand, we are tempted to separate from society, to only have close relationships with people who think as we think and believe as we believe. Now, I've had times where I've fallen for one of those temptations or the other, and I know that you have as well. It would have been a very comfortable calling 
if Jesus had said, go along, get along, blend in. It also would have been a very comfortable calling if Jesus had said, separate, don't have anything to do with the world around you, only have significant relationships with people who think as you think. But Jesus said, neither one is what I'm calling you into. He said, I'm calling you to be in the world and yet not of the world at the same time. We see this most clearly in John chapter 17. This entire chapter in John chapter 17 is one long uh, prayer from Jesus. Uh, people call it the high, uh, the high priestly prayer because it was the prayer that he lifted up before he uh, was arrested and eventually crucified. And in this prayer, here's one of the things he said to his father. My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So you notice the priority that he has here is that we recognize that though we are not of this world, we're nevertheless to be in this world where we can be an influence to other people. How can you do that? How can you live in this world when you are not of this world? Where there, there are instructions all throughout the Bible about that, including these two little verses in Colossians chapter 4. It requires wisdom, Paul said. It requires wisdom to be in this uncomfortable position of being in the world, even if you are not of the world. And that wisdom is characterized by three things. You need to make sure that your relationships are timely and gracious and seasoned. Those are the three things that I want us to focus on from this passage today. So have your sermon notes out, and first of all, write this down. Speak to non-believers with timely words. He says here, make the most of every opportunity. So the first point uh, is that the best way to improve your communication is to have communication to begin with. It's very difficult to set about trying to improve something you're not doing at all. And so Paul said, have conversations with people who are non-believers. The phrase is, make the most of every opportunity. The Greek phrase there literally is, redeeming the time. And so you, you redeem something, that means to buy it up, sometimes at great cost to yourself. You see it out on a sale table and you snatch it up. You, you get that opportunity to buy that up. And, and the Apostle Paul said that's the way you need to look at life. You need to see, you need to see it as limited opportunities in, in, in the history of your life. And you need to buy it up. You need to make the most of every opportunity. Now, I want you to notice three things about this phrase, make the most of every opportunity. One thing I want you to note is that this applies to every one of us who belong to the kingdom of God not just certain persons. You know, you've seen those stunts on TV sometimes when somebody revs up his motorcycle and then he jumps over 13 school buses and before that happens, the announcer comes on and says, as if you didn't already need to know, now don't try this at home, kids. This is only for professionals. And I think that's the way some of us look upon witnessing, sharing our faith. It's best done by the professionals, it's not for us. But this passage, this, 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 this command, make the most of every opportunity, it, it was meant for every one of us. I've told you before that sometimes I will run across somebody who says, you know, that's not my gift. I recognize in the Bible that certain people have certain gifts, and, and my gift lies in other areas. I hope the people who have the gift of evangelism are using theirs, but my gift is to be, ex is to be expressed in other ways. And, and, and people like that misunderstand the whole idea of spiritual giftedness. You know, some of us are gifted in prayer, but all of us are called on to pray. Some of us are gifted in generosity, but all of us are called on to be generous. Some of us are gifted in mercy, uh, but all of us, unfortunately, are called on to be merciful. <laughs> and, and, and some of us are gifted in evangelism, but all of us are called on to evangelize, to share our faith, to, to not be silent about the, the source of our strength and the source of our hope. All of us are called on to do that. In this passage, Paul didn't say, you pastors in the church in Colossae, make the most of every opportunity, the rest of you are off the hook. He didn't say, you deacons in Colossae, make the most of every opportunity, the rest of you are off the hook. 
This is a command that is given to every one of us. I want you to notice something else about this command. It is a bracing verb, isn't it? Make the most of every opportunity. It was as if Paul knew he had to kind of slap us awake out of our natural tendency to procrastinate about this matter. It's interesting how we can sanctify disobedience and we can sanctify our procrastination by saying, well, you know, I know I need to earn the right to be heard before I share my faith. And it's true, we need to earn the right to be heard. But do you think it takes several decades for you to earn the right to be heard? Probably not. Or some people say, well, I'm waiting for the right time, the right conditions. But you know, there's a Bible verse that warns us about that. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4, the preacher wrote, He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. In other words, you reap by planting, not by hesitant waiting for just the right conditions. God tells us to share his message of love with others, and we waste precious time waiting for just the right time, just the right mood, just the right wording, just the right introduction. But if you watch the wind, you will not sow, and if you look at the clouds, you will not reap. I think that uh, we need to pay attention to the fact then that Paul commanded us with an urgent word, a bracing word, that is designed to kind of slap us awake and, and cause us to not be procrastinators anymore when it comes to this issue. I said there were three things about this word or this, this phrase, make the most of every opportunity. Here's a third thing I want you to note about this. Notice he does not say make opportunities. He says make the most of every opportunity. What I want to emphasize at this point is that there are too many of us that think of witnessing in this way, that we sort of artificially gen up some a way to talk about Jesus in a conversation that wasn't going that direction. That we have to somehow shoehorn Jesus into a conversation and all of a sudden make everybody around the Thanksgiving table feel awkward. In other words, we assume that our command, the command that we're to obey is to make opportunities. But in this passage, we are told to make every, or, or, or to take every advantage of the opportunities that are put in front of us. In other words, we need to realize that there are all kinds of openings that are happening all around us. We're just not sensitive to them or obedient to walk through those doors that open up to us. There are all kinds of opportunities that are always opening up around us to talk about the source of our strength and our hope. And we need to just take advantage of those opportunities. Make the most of every opportunity, the Apostle Paul said. And every now and then I'll run across a, a, an article that sort of totals up the, the amount of time you're going to spend in your lifetime on certain mundane things. And it's always sobering to read an article like this. Uh, one article said that you're going to, the average American is going to spend six months of his lifetime sitting in traffic. Eight months of your lifetime will have been uh, spent dealing with junk mail of the physical variety and the email variety. A full year will have been consumed by looking for misplaced objects. Some of you say only a year. Two years will have been dedicated to unsuccessfully returning phone calls. Four years will have been invested in housework. Five years will have been committed to waiting in lines. Three and a half years will have been consumed by staring at social media on our phones. Six years will have been given over to eating. And how much time at the end of your life, cumulatively, how much time will God reveal to you that you spent sharing the source of your hope and your strength and your joy? with other people. The Apostle Paul said, make the most of every opportunity. Redeem the time. Take advantage of the opportunities and the doors that open up naturally around you to speak about the source of your joy and your hope. Here's a second thing I want you to write down. Speak to non-believers with gracious words. Speak to non-believers with gracious words. Let your conversation, Paul says, be always full of grace. Now I want you to notice how the second point balances out the first point. The first point was speak to non-believers with timely words. And there are times when I need that. I get, I get lazy or I fear what people might think of me if I talk about my faith. And so I need that reminder to make the most of every opportunity. But there are times when I need this second reminder from our text, speak to non-believers with gracious words. I confess that I've had moments when I'm not too lazy to speak about my faith, but I am too abrasive when speaking about my faith. There are times when I have to fight not my fear of witnessing, but my aggressiveness 
when it comes to talking with others about my faith. It's then that I need this word from God. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Doesn't it stand to reason that if you're going to talk about grace, you ought to have grace? Isn't that important? It's the same thing Simon Peter wrote in his first letter. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he said, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the, the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. It's just like what Paul said in Colossians chapter 4. Simon Peter must have known the church would have had two temptations, either to hide our Jesus from others or to witness to others, but do so in this abrasive, haughty, holier-than-thou way. Jesus' conversation was characterized by grace, and if we follow that kind of Lord, our conversation will be characterized by grace. The Old Testament tells us that when the Messiah would come, he would be known as a gracious person. The New Testament tells us when the Messiah did come, he was known as a gracious person. So in the Old Testament, Psalm 45, verse 2, this is the prophecy of the future king. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace. In the New Testament, in Luke chapter 4, verse 22, it says of Jesus, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. So there's a prophecy in the Old Testament, fulfillment in the New Testament about the graciousness of our Lord. We need to talk as Jesus talked, with gracious words. Too many of us are blunt, we are tactless, we are rigid, we are judgmental. And frankly, it's our way of trying to, you know, interact with a world that is so different than us. Remember, I said that there are two temptations that we could give into. One is to just sort of blend in, to go along and get along. And when that's your temptation, you need to pay attention to the first thing that Paul says here. You need to speak. You need to be open about your faith. But the other temptation is to sort of withdraw from the world. And, and if, if that's the case, then anytime we have any sort of interaction with the world, we're going to be haughty and we're going to be judgmental and we're going to be sanctimonious and holier than thou. And it's kind of our way to show ourselves and everybody else how separate we are from a world that is very different from us, to show people that we're not of this world. But we need to make sure that we are balanced in this endeavor. We need to make sure we're speaking and not hiding our faith. And yet at the same time as we speak, we need to be gracious, as the Apostle Paul teaches here in other passages as well. So God did not call us to the comfortable position of going along and getting along and hiding our faith. Paul did not call us to the, uh, to the comfortable position of sort of separating from the world and only being with people who are like us. We are called to the uncomfortable position of being in the world and not of it, speaking, but speaking graciously. Here's a third thing to note. Speak to non-believers with seasoned words, with seasoned words. Let your conversation, Paul says, be seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, we call somebody in our culture, we call somebody seasoned when they are experienced, when they have enough experience that they now have wisdom on the job or wisdom in life and they instinctively know how to solve a problem because they've seen it before they've faced it before that's a seasoned person and Paul is telling us in this passage that that's the way we need to, do, to, to be we need to be experienced enough in our interactions with outsiders that over time we become seasoned so that we have the wisdom to know how to answer a certain question in the right way with the right tone and so on. Now, now, this is not the way that everybody understands this phrase, seasoned with salt. There are three different ways that Bible teachers have understood what Paul is trying to say here. So let me go over them with you. First, some say, like salt livens up the flavor of a dish, make your conversation lively and interesting. In our day, that's the primary use of salt, right? We sprinkle it on our black-eyed peas, it, it flavors up the dish. Uh, if you are a proper Christian, red-blooded American, you'll put salt on your watermelon. I said it. That's what you're supposed to do. It will bring out the flavor of your watermelon. I didn't know that was going to be the most controversial thing I said today. <laughs> there are some Bible teachers that say that that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us here. Make your conversation lively, winsome, entertaining. 
And even though I don't think that's what Paul is meaning in this passage, I do believe our conversation should be livened up with wit and charm. For, for too long, we've allowed people to assume that if you talk about serious subjects, if you talk about theology, if you talk about what's right and wrong, it always has to be done in some sort of somber tone. Our talk should be bright, it should be alive. I once saw a cartoon in a church leadership journal where a man was in a suit and tie and overcoat. He was on a commuter bus, he had a briefcase, bags under his eyes, had, his mouth was droopy, and obviously he was answering the question from the woman next to him because on the cartoon it said, no ma'am, I'm not a preacher, I just have a bad cold. <laughs> now the reality is that some of us maybe think about religion in that way. It's somber, it brings us down, but that's not the way it ought to be. So even though I don't think that's what Paul is saying when he said season your conversation with salt, I do think that our conversation should be lively and it should be entertaining. We should let people know about the joy of the Lord. Uh, here's another way that Bible teachers understand this passage, season with salt. Some say that like salt purifies, like salt preserves, make sure that your conversation is edifying and uplifting and encouraging. Now again, I don't think that's what Paul is meaning here, but it is true that our conversation should be edifying and encouraging. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that you and I are to be the salt of the earth. And in that context, in that instance, Jesus was referring to the way that people use salt in his day as a preservative, uh, as a way of purifying things. And, uh, and so some Bible teachers uh, think that since that's the way Jesus used that image of salt in the Sermon on the Mount, surely that's what Paul means here. And our conversation should be edifying, it should be enriching. I don't think that's what Paul meant, but I do think that we need to make sure our conversation is edifying and enriching, that through what we have to say and the way we say it, that we have this sort of purifying, preserving influence in our culture. We need to do that. But when Paul said, season your speech with salt, I believe that what Paul meant was, in our conversation with nonbelievers, we need to be seasoned. Um, the, the rabbis of the day spoke of wisdom as salt. And I think that Paul, the old rabbi that he was, was using the idea of salt in this way, that we need to be wise, we need to be seasoned. How do you become wise? How do you become seasoned? Through experience, through trial and error, through learning from your mistakes, through engaging with that situation at work so that you know what to do the next time it comes around. And I think that's what the Apostle Paul is saying to you and me here, is that we need to be seasoned communicators of the gospel with other people in our world. And you know that changes from time to time and from generation to generation, right? You know, I've been at this for over 40 years now, and I've been at this in various settings, in Louisiana, in North Texas, and the Cayman Islands, and now for the last 20 years in the most unchurched community in Texas. And I can tell you that the gospel has never changed. Wherever I've gone, the gospel message is the same. But the way I've had to communicate it, the questions that I've had to address, that changes over time. And if you aren't changing over time, you're being disobedient to the Bible because the Bible tells us we need to be seasoned communicators. We gain wisdom as we engage with other people about the message. Now, how do you get more seasoned? How do you get more experienced? Well, by putting it into practice, by having conversations with people about your faith. Can a book on evangelism help you? Sure, I've got a lot of books on my shelf about evangelism. I continue to read them, uh, new books that come out even today. Can a two-day seminar help you share your faith? Sure, I've been at some of those seminars. I've taught some of those seminars before. We'll continue to do so. But really, this is very much on-the-job training. The only way that you're going to become a seasoned communicator of your faith is by communicating your faith and by learning from your mistakes and by trial and error, this is very much on the job training. And so the Apostle Paul tells us here that we need to not hide away in our little holy huddles and we don't need to just blend in and go along and get along. We're not of this world, but we're nevertheless in this world and that's the way it's supposed to be so that we can influence people by talking about the source of our hope and our strength. You've been called to this uncomfortable position you may be in the world, but you're not of the world. 
And you need to make sure then that we are being wise in the way we go about this task. Now, how should we respond to all of this today? In one of three ways. First of all, if you are a believer, one of the things you need to do is realize these words are for you. No matter how new you are to the faith, no matter how inexperienced you are at sharing your faith with others, these words are for you. And you need to learn how to be in the world and yet not of the world. What about those of you who are not yet believers? What about you? I hope that you all respond to this message today and receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, trusting that what he did for you on the cross takes away your sin so that you might be right in your relationship with God here and hereafter. And then there are others of you who are looking for a church home. What do you need to do in response to this message today? Well, I hope that you will let God lead you to a church that will teach you how to be in the world and yet not of the world at the same time. This is what we're trying to be as a church. And if God is leading you here, then I hope that you'll let us know of your interest. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us in all the ways that we need to respond to this message today. Help us as believers to realize that our calling is not to go along and get along. Neither is our calling to hide away from this big bad world. But we are people who are not of this world and yet in it to influence it. Help us then from what we've learned today to do a better job of that. And I pray for those who need to become believers or join up with a church, this church perhaps. And I pray that you'll lead them in the right direction. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.